All right, I'm going to get started because this is a long presentation. <laughs> Should I leave it as co-host or should I press the reclaim host button? Um, leave it as co-host. Okay, you got it. Hi everybody. Welcome to tonight's presentation. My name is Melissa. And I wanna thank you guys for joining us for our workshop tonight on stopping eloping, elopement and children with ASD. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. There is a lot of information in this presentation. So I do wanna get started as quickly as possible. Please feel free to post questions in the chat box or the Q&A box uh, as we proceed with the presentation. And I will be available to answer live questions at the end. So without further delay, let's get started. As I said, there is a lot of information to share in this presentation. I got pregnant with my daughter. I felt so grateful and so blessed. And, and my life up until that point had been pretty rocky. I'd had a lot of uh, bumps and bruises along the way. And I finally thought that I was turning a corner and God was blessing me with this beautiful gift of a child. And I just, yes, you know, finally something was going my way. And then when she was born, she was just absolutely perfect. I had all of these uh, dreams and expectations for her. I thought of the things that I thought she was going to do. Good girl. Right after the first birthday, I started to notice her behavior change. She went from, uh, you know, saying that. She was obsessed with Dora the Explorer, uh, Mama, Dada, she was saying it all. Good girl, say math. Uh, hit all of her milestones up to that point. She walked at one. She was eating solid. She just, you know, she looked really good. And then I just remember her felt almost overnight or very quickly where her demeanor just changed. She went from this super happy baby to crying and tantruming and frustrated all the time. And I remember saying to my mom one day during one of these tantrums, like, you know, where did my happy baby go? But I didn't think anything past it. I think I was kind of not ready to fathom that something could be off She started to lose the words that she had made. She wasn't saying mama anymore. She wasn't saying ma'am. Um, she just seemed really disconnected from us. Instead of playing with her toys, she would take them, dump them all out of her toy box and just start twisting them around her hands aimlessly uh, with no intended purpose. She's really kind of in denial about it. And then I remember one day we were in the middle of a store and then all of a sudden out of nowhere, she just like started like screaming and yelling like somebody had slapped her. I don't even know what the problem was. And I was so, I was so mortified. I didn't even know what to do. I was so scared. I literally just left the half full cart in the store, picked her up and just ran out of there. Never went to that store again. I was so, I just didn't even know what to think. And that was probably the first time it really kind of stung for me that maybe something is wrong. Um, they didn't diagnose her right away. They said that you know she was too young for a diagnosis. I didn't even know what they meant when they said that. I was like, diagnosed with what? You know, I just had no idea what they were talking about. And then they said, you know, um, you know, we'll come back in if you're not seeing progress. I said, okay, you know. And a couple months later, I'm watching these speech therapists play with her on the floor. I'm not seeing any progress. It felt like she was getting a little worse. And then we went for our two-year-old uh, wellness visit. And the doctor said that she was behind if she wasn't using 20 words with intent. And that was just, that was probably just the knife to my heart um, at that point. I really couldn't deny it. 
uh, that something was up with her uh, anymore. So then I uh, called the county back in and then she was diagnosed on the spectrum. And I remember that day and it was uh, the worst days of my life. It was the, it was my darkest hour. I could easily say that um, as a mother, as a woman, uh, as just a human being, it was probably one of the hardest times I had ever gone through. And I so, so happy with God, so thankful. I struggled to figure out what this meant or what we were going to do or how this was going to define her. All those dreams I had for her future were just completely shattered, and I just had no idea what was going to happen next. And I went full to just complete blank when I thought about the future. One night I was thinking, you know, I'm going to die. I'm just going to care for her like her mother. And something about that thought just snapped me out of my depression we gotta get to work here, you know. I promised that when she was born, I was gonna be the best mother I could be to her. And that promise it hasn't changed. The fact that she means more now than ever, not less. She, you know. And I didn't know at the time what we were capable of, or what she, having those changes, that mind shift, mindset shift for me was gonna do. But um, I wanted to know that at the end of every night, I could look myself in the mirror with confidence and say, you know, it's you. Do everything you could for this child to give her the best possible life. And the immediate answer was yes, and that was a good day. And I wanted the answer to be yes, 100%. And no matter where the cards fell, I know I can leave this earth saying I gave her everything, everything I had, no regrets. As I've navigated this world with her and walked away that day after having that thought, I really just grabbed the bull by the horns. I can be a advocate. I'm not a special education, master's degree teacher. I don't know any, I never had any legal training in ADA, but I knew that I was going to learn whatever I needed to learn to be really strong for her. And Juliana um, lost all of her language. Cheerios? <laughs> Okay, she was not verbal when she was diagnosed with talk her sign language. Show me. Yeah, show me. She went from sign language to court approximations. And she started to speak. She went from the most restrictive preschool environment. Um, she was in the 614, most restrictive preschool, special education preschool environment. You could be in. She's in the second grade class in a gen ed school, integrated class with typical peers. She speaks beautifully now. What did you like about the school experience? I like when they did like coffee. Uh -huh. And I like the thing that like touched the table. She has a personality. She has conversation skills. There's still things that we need to work on, but for the most part, her future went from black to now having possibilities. And none of that could have happened had I not kind of gotten out of my own way and really hit the ground running and started to take action for her. And I can't say that I can do that for every parent I coach, but what I can tell them is I will have them feeling like I did, looking at myself in the mirror, you looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, I was everything I could be for her today. I have no regrets. And however it ha whatever happens, it happens. It's really for us as parents. We fulfilled the duty that we promised when we had these children, which was to be the best versions of ourselves, to live 
to raise these children. I've helped now hundreds of mothers, coached them one-on-one -on -one to do the same things I did, to help them to be strong, to help them to craft plans where we're seeing constant progress. This is what I want to do. I want to give you the chance that Juliana's had. I want to give you every opportunity to give your child that kind of life. I love that video so much every single time we watch it. Oh, so let's talk about the reason that you guys have signed up for this workshop tonight, which is to talk about elopement. And along the way, we will definitely be discussing some of those things that Michelle was talking about, specifically changing that mindset and really kind of getting out of your own way and reaching out for help um, to people like us that are here specifically to help you guys. So let's talk about elopement. There's a lot of information in this presentation, and then I will be available to answer questions when we are done with the presentation. Elopement, which is also known as wandering, is the tendency of an individual to leave the safety of a responsible person's care or safe area, and that can result in potential harm or injury. Some individuals with autism have challenges understanding safety issues and communicating with others. For example, such a child could run off from home to play in the pond down the street and might be unable to say his name or where he lives. Excuse me. This can happen quickly, even under constant supervision. So let's talk about some autism and elopement facts. 49% of children with autism engage in elopement. Yes, almost half of all children on the autism spectrum engage in elopement. 35% of those children attempt to wander at least once per week. So that's more than 50 times a year. More than a third of the kids who will elope will wander at least 50 times a year. More than one third of children with autism who, are, who elope are not able to communicate their name, their address, or their phone number. Children with ASD who are verbal might still have difficulty communicating when they're stressed, when they're confused, when they're afraid. 29%, almost a third of elopement occurs from a classroom or a school. We're gonna talk about ways to um, improve the safety of your child's classroom if your child is an eloper. You, you send your child to school under the assumption that they're going to be safe. They've got professionals there that are trained, that know what they're doing, that have constant supervision. There's always eyes on my child, and I know that they're going to be safe as long, at least during the hours that they're in school. I don't have to worry so much about their safety. And here we go. A third of elopement occurs from a classroom or from a school. One of my nephews, who is on the spectrum, eloped from his classroom and the school had no idea where he was for over half an hour. He was gratefully, he was under the staircase playing a video game that he had smuggled into school that he knew he wasn't supposed to bring into school, found a place to hide where he could play his game. Nobody at school knew where he was for almost 40 minutes. Seemed like way longer than that. 42% of autism-related elopement causes cases involve children nine years old or younger. Of the lethal outcomes for a child with ASD who eloped, 90% of those are related to accidental drowning. So life vests on camping and boating trips should always be worn. Even if your child does not like the sensory feel of it, it is vital because if you are on a camping trip or you are on a boating trip and your child elopes, it could end tragically. So let's talk a little bit more about elopement and insights. Elopement is usually a form of communication. It's telling you, I need something, I want something, or I don't want something. Children with ASD will elope, wander, or bolt to get something that they're interested in or to get away from something that's bothering them. 
Home-related elopement incidents typically spike between April and August, which is very important for you as parents to know. School-related elopement increases through the fall and winter months, which makes sense because that's when they're adjusting sometimes to a brand new classroom, a brand new school, a brand new teacher, brand new classmates, brand new rules, new schedule, maybe new related service providers, there's usually some change or transition. Even just transitioning from being home for a few weeks over the summer, if your child attends the summer school program, or for a few months if they don't, and transi transitioning back to the classroom in and of itself is a big change, which can result in stress and anxiety, which can result in elopement. So let's talk a little bit about the reasons for elopement. When children elope, they're trying to communicate something. And once you figure out what they're trying to say, you can help them communicate that need in a much safer way than just running away or wandering away. So some examples of that include, if your child loves water, make sure that he or she often goes to the swimming pool, supervised, of course. Make it part of a schedule that he or she knows well, so they know when to expect it. They don't have to elope to achieve it because they don't know when they might get access to water again. If they know it's coming up on their schedule, they might be less, like, less inclined to feel like they have to escape in order to get access to something that they really want. If he or she has a special interest, include that in his or her routines. So again, they don't have to elope to access it. So if there's a special place that your child really likes to go to, take a picture of that place or an icon that represents that place and put it in the schedule. That way your child can predict when they have access, when it's coming up. Otherwise, again, they might feel like they just have to run away in order to get their hit of that thing that they're looking for so much, right? They want access. And if they don't know access is coming, they're gonna go get their own access. So take a picture, put it in the schedule, let them see when they're gonna have access to that reinforcer. If their escapes are related to specific stimuli, try to prevent them. But when you can't prevent them, be sure to be extra vigilant in their presence. So if you know your child is going to run to pet any dog that they see, if you see somebody turning in the corner with a leash in hand, you're going to want to take a little step closer to your child, maybe hold their hand, put your arm around their shoulder, or just be on extra alert because you know it's about to be more likely that my child might elope from me. Your child might love to run and explore. So you want to teach them to request this activity using words, signs, pictures, verbal approximations, a communication device, whatever can get their point across appropriately, they can now ask to go access that place or activity. Is your child afraid of animals or is he or she drawn to them? So these are things that you need to know so that you can predict if it's more or less likely that your child's about to bolt. Let's talk about some stressors that can contribute to elopement. So things that make it more likely that your child is going to elope. Unfamiliar settings, being off of their typical routine or schedule, public outings, transition periods, so going from one thing to another, holidays, which are typically off schedule or different in some way or involve people that you may not see all at once or all the time, Vacations, again, new places, new experiences, new environments, new people, new demands, new expectations, camping trips, outdoor gatherings, a recent move to a new home or a school, visiting an unfamiliar setting, pursuit of their special interest, trying to escape uncomfortable sensory stimuli. So if you see that your child is getting uncomfortable, it might be more likely that they are now going to try to elope from the room. Ask for help. Elopement can be dangerous. So don't be afraid to ask for help when you're trying to prevent it. When you're at an event 
when you're at an event with a lot of family and friends, it might seem like all hands are on deck and that there are always eyes on your child, but these situations can be overwhelming and can trigger elopement behavior. You wanna communicate with your family and friends to make sure your child's safety is top of mind. Be vocal about who is watching out for your child so it's always top of mind for someone and let people know when you need them to tag in. So you don't want there to be that diffusion of responsibility where because there are so many people here, everybody is assuming somebody else is watching Jimmy, okay? If you need to step away or you are not vigilant in watching Jimmy at that moment because you're helping one of your other children or talking to your spouse or visiting with the people who are at this event that you're at, you need to tell somebody, Lisa, I need you to watch Jimmy or Johnny, I need you to watch Jimmy until I get back. Let them know what the expectations are. Tell them I'll be gone five or 10 minutes. If it's too much for you, come and get me. Or if you need a break before I get back, ask Rachel to help you. She's right over there. So be proactive and make sure somebody is assigned the task of watching your child if it is not you. And if it is you, you might want to tag in some extra help just in case. I'm going to be keeping an eye on Jimmy, but I also have to keep an eye on his brothers and sisters. So can you guys just make sure that, you know, if he goes anywhere near the pool, you keep an extra eye on him because he, he might try and jump in, even if he's not wearing the swimmies. So make everybody aware. If someone has their dog locked up, let them know, listen, Jimmy loves dogs. And even though you posted a big sign on the door, do not enter dog inside, do not open door. He's not going to pay attention to the sign. And if he knows the dog is in there, he's going to try to get in there. So if you see him go into the house, please follow him because he might open the door and let the dog out. So it's important to let people know what to expect and to give people specific responsibilities if you need to ask for help. Let's discuss some preventative strategies. We have a lot of preventative strategies. So in terms of preventative strategies, we talk about using visual supports and prompts, physical boundaries, service dogs, alarms or auditory alerts, tracking devices, identifying information, and we're going to discuss each one of these in detail. So let's talk about visual supports and strategies first. So you could use visual supports in order to give your child a visual cue, like a stop sign. So here's an example of a visual cue that you could print out. You could post stop signs by the door to remind your child that they have to have an adult's permission to leave. If they don't stop completely, these signs can make your child stop for a moment, giving you the chance to kind of intervene and catch them or prompt them to ask you if it's okay to leave. Even if you lock the door, which you should if your child is an eloper, still put the stop sign on, on this side of the door so that your child gets used to seeing like the stop sign means I have to stop and do something. I have to ask for help. I have to wait for guidance that says I can move forward. Other supports and strategies, visual supports and strategies are um, tape or a stop guard banner. So instead of just using the stop sign, if that's not enough for your child, if they don't understand that yet, or if it's not enough to, again, prevent them from going past that barrier, you might want to put up actual tape or an actual stop guard banner. So you can place tape across the doors as a reminder to your child that they have to have an adult's permission to leave. You could put the guard, the banner, with the stop sign that's across the door on the screen. Um, across the door, again, it's a physical boundary that will remind your child that we cannot cross this door without additional assistance or permission. Again, if they don't stop them completely, it can give it a second for your child to either distract them or to block them, to give you enough time to, to get in and intervene and prevent your child from leaving. Other visual supports and strategies, 
make your child stand out visually. This is one that we use for my nephew a lot. We use this neon yellow hat. And every time we go out in public, he is wearing this neon yellow hat. And it makes it a lot easier to find him in a group of people, even just a group of our own family members. We know we, all we have to do is look for the hat. Oh, there he is. We know exactly where he is. So you can use glow sticks, reflective or bright colored clothing, just to increase your child's visibility while going into the community or while you're at crowded events. This makes it much easier to watch your child from a distance and to find them more quickly in a crowd. And seconds matter. You might use physical boundaries, such as a baby gate. So you can block the doorway to your child's room to the exit, to the door that you don't want your child to leave through in order to keep your child from leaving their room in the middle of the night or to leave the room that you are putting them in at the moment. So if you want them to be playing in their playroom and while you're making dinner, you might wanna put up a, a baby gate across the, the playroom door um, or while they're playing in their room or overnight if you're worried that your child might elope from their room in the middle of the night. Other physical boundaries include an enclosed bed with a locking system prevents unattended wandering at night. You can find this type of bed as a standard bed or a portable bed to take with you when you travel and they come in twin size or full size. So you can look online and if you just Google and at the end, I have a list of resources for you. Um, but these, these are some examples, the pictures on screen are examples of different kinds of enclosed beds. So the first one that basically looks kind of like a crib, um, it's not fully enclosed, but it makes it more difficult for this child to just stand up and get out of bed. They would have to actually climb out of the bed. And for this particular child, this was enough of a barrier. If you look at the other two, there are actually netted screens that zipper up um, that encloses your child. And you can see the picture on the bottom is portable. So they can bring that with them to a hotel where they don't necessarily have all of the other um, preventative strategies that they may have at home. These are netted boundaries, but there are some that have wooden boundaries or plastic boundaries or plexiglass boundaries and things like that. Of course, with breathing air and things like that, but these can be so helpful in allowing your child to sleep in their bed, in their room safely and allow you to get a peaceful night's sleep as well without having to worry that your child is wandering the house or worse, the streets. Other physical boundaries here, these are called the safety sleeper. These are other um, enclosed beds. So the safety sleeper, which is a specific trademark. So that's something that you could Google and look for, and it will come up with a variety of other brands as well. But this is a medical bed designed to prevent users from wandering at night. There's built-in padding, which reduces the risk of injury from uncontrolled movement or self harming behavior like head banging or excessive uh, perseverative movements and things like that. So there are things like this out there that if this is something that you need for your child to sleep better at night, then this is something that you can Google and get. It's custom built to fit the needs of every user. It's portable for travel so users can feel at home in any location. It has a variety of safety features so the family can rest easy, and it's built from durable materials and enhanced joints to stand up against heavy use and play, and it's fully enclosed to provide security and prevent unattended wandering. Now let's discuss some physical boundaries. Deadbolts and locks, another way to slow down or stop a child who is trying to leave the home without permission. You can use keypad door locks, battery operated alarms for sliding doors that open into your yard, keypad door locks so that anybody trying to exit the house needs to input a code, otherwise an alarm goes off, portable locks. While traveling, you can get a portable lock to provide extra security. In case of an emergency, you can remove the lock in seconds in the dark but it will be much more difficult for your child to do so. So portable locks are another way if you're traveling to stay safe, or if you don't have a deadbolt or you don't want to install a deadbolt in your child's bedroom, you might want to use a portable lock as well. Also Google-able. 
Other physical boundaries include secure ground floor windows. So if your child's bedroom is on the ground floor, you will also need to secure the bedroom windows. Hardware store carries special locks like the picture on the lower corner um, next to the window. Um, that, that is an example of a special lock that can secure windows. If your child breaks glass or pounds on windows or bangs or kicks on windows, which I have had students that do that, um, replace the glass planes with plexiglass to prevent injury. That way your child can't just hit it and break through it or kick it and break through it. And if it does break, it won't shatter and cut them the way glass will. Some parents have even had to put wooden boards over windows to prevent injury or elopement. So again, it depends on the level of safety and security that you need to ensure in your house, how determined your child is once they decide that they are going to leave um, or when they get really upset or frustrated. So if your child is someone who will punch and kick and hit and, and, and get destructive like that, you may need to put some extra security over your windows. Additional physical boundaries are locking up the fences. So if you have a door that opens into your backyard that your child could access or could get into the backyard through another open window, you need to make sure that the fence is locked, that there's a gate or a fence that's locked. You can use a padlock for the gate. You can um, put up a fence to, as a last line of defense. Um, again, these the fence with the gate, you can have a key lock, you can have a, a, a padlock, you can have a keypad lock, you can have a combination lock. There are a variety of different locking mechanisms for the gates. Other physical boundaries. So if you have difficulties with your child eloping from the car, you can get the seat belt buckle guard. Again, Googleable. This is a seat belt lock that is designed to prevent children from releasing the seat belt while the car is in motion. The, uh, another brand is Angel Guard. The safety seat belt release cover acts as a safety barrier. It deters children from unlocking their own seat belts. Another brand is Buckle Roo, which is a, just like. Um, as an example in the picture is a buckle roo. Um, and again, that ensures that your child is safe inside your own vehicle. Some additional physical boundaries for elopers if you're going into the community. A safety wristband that ties you to your child. If you have a runner and you're going to be in a crowded place, this is another potential option. One goes on your hand, the other goes on your child's hand. So if they break your grip and you're not holding hands or you're doing something with your hand and they use that opportunity to run away, or like I said, they break grip with you and try to run, they are attached to you by this cord that they cannot just simply pull away from and break off. So this is uh, the safety wristband, also Googleable, um, is very handy for kids that bolt when you're in a crowded situation. And service dogs can not only be an amazing companion, but can be a great help to prevent runners from succeeding. If you're out and about and your child tries to run away, the service dog to which your child is attached will just stop and sit or lie down, preventing your child from escaping. So instead of being attached to you, your child would be attached to your dog. And if your child tried to run, the dog comes trained to sit and lay down so your child can escape and to bark to alert you. Like there's a lot of things that service dogs can be trained to do. Okay, so now let's discuss alarms and auditory alerts. Okay, we've talked about visual supports. Uh, we've talked about physical boundaries. Now let's talk about alarms and auditory cues. Okay, so you can get a battery operated alarm for your doors so if you don't wanna get a full home security system, which can be expensive and can come with monthly monitoring fees, you can get a battery operated alarm, such as the toddler monitor. The toddler monitor hangs on a child's door or an exit door or any door you want and sends an alert to your phone if they leave the room. GE battery operated alarms are easy to install, inexpensive, and are available at many retail outlets like Walmart or Target, or can be ordered online. So again, if you're making dinner and you need your child to be playing in the playroom, 
you can put the toddler monitor on the door. So if your child goes to leave the playroom, you will be alerted immediately. If your child is a wanderer at night, you can put the toddler monitor on their door. And if they try to leave their room in the middle of the night, you will get an alert to your phone, which again, you can set to be any sound that you want that would wake you up and alert you to that fact. Other alarms and auditory cues, a center pad. So these are, um, this, these are two different kinds of sensor pads. So there's one sensor pad that would be that would go under the mattress, okay? And it would be triggered when your child gets out of bed. So if your child gets up and leaves the bed and the pressure is removed from the mat once the alarm is set, an alarm will go off to let you know that your child has left the bed. There's another one. So that's the top one in the pictures here. The bottom picture is a sensor mat that goes on the floor. So if your child stepped out of the bed and stepped onto the mat, then uh, the, the alarm would be triggered. So again, depending on what your needs are, um, if your child would understand like, oh, I have to step over that mat in the middle of the night, then you might want to get the sensor that goes under the mattress. Again, depends on what your needs are. Other alarms and auditory alerts, a doorstop alarm. So a doorstop alarm, you stick in the as a doorstop and once somebody opens the door the door stopper alarm will go off which alerts you uh, to your child opening the door so actually the door would be closed and you put the um stopper there and then if somebody goes to open the door and the pressure is taken off that pedal then the alarm will go off so while the door is closed and that pedal gets pushed down like kind of under the the door jam and as soon as you open the door, then the pedal kind of pops up and the alarm goes off. And then again, you're alerted to the fact that your child is trying to leave the room. I apologize if I'm speaking quickly, but I know that there are so many slides and I just wanna be sure to give you all of the information and still be available to answer any questions you might have at the end of the presentation. Okay, additional alarms and auditory alerts a wanderer alarm with a motion detector. So again, this is not necessarily like a big house alarm that you have to set up monitoring fees and monthly fees and have a whole installation in your house. This is something that you can set up in the hallway. It can detect movement in the bedroom or hallway and can alert you if your child tries to leave their room or set it to alert you um, if your child is approaching the front door or approaching the back door or the basement door or whichever door you're having difficulty keeping your child from exiting through. Other alarms and auditory alerts, security systems and alarms. So you could install a home security system on the doors and windows, which will immediately alert you if your child opens the door. Now, again, there are a variety of different home alarms security systems, depending on your price point. There are a lot of them out there. Um, so you would have to look and see what your options are. Let's look at some tracking devices. So wearable tracking devices allow you to track your child on your phone, cutting down the time it takes to find them. There's a wide range of tracking devices available. So let's take a look at some of the examples that I um, got pictures of for you. So you could just get an idea of some of the wearables that are out there. There are a lot. So if you, um, you can get a lanyard. So a lanyard at Amber Alert GPS, you can get a watch at a Daint. So if you look at the uh, top, left, um, a Daint Mobile has an app. Um, you can get a watch or a little clip. Um, you can get a belt, you can get a shirt, you can get a pouch at Angel Sense GPS, okay? If you choose to use a personal locating device, parents should field test the equipment in different locations, terrain and various types of weather as if it was a real life situation. So say as an example, you're gonna go camping and you wanna really make sure like, God forbid your child gets away from you while you're camping, right? So you wanna get one of these devices just on the in case, just that extra proactive security that your child is GPSed. 
you don't want to test it if your child happens to get away from you. So go out to a similar location, make sure that it works, that it works well, that it works if it's foggy, it works if it's raining, that um, go to the website, um, look at the reviews, see if there are issues with it before you buy it, but test it try it out yourself. You don't want the first time you're using this to be when you're in a panic because your child has gone missing. So practice first and then hope you never ever have to utilize what you've practiced. So let's look at some of these track, track some considerations when you're thinking about getting a tracking device. Battery life. So you want to ask yourself when you're deciding which tracking device to get, um, you want to ask yourself, does this unit have to be charged? And if so, how often? And is my child unprotected while this device is charging? Is it water resistant? Can the unit be worn while bathing, swimming, showering, showering? Will the unit transmit a signal if underwater? Is the unit removable by the wearer? And is your child able to remove that themselves? Is geofencing or a perimeter notification available, which means you can set it for like a 50 yard radius. So if your child goes more than 50 yards from your phone, you will get an alert that your child is past the, the perimeter that you've set. S what is the cellular service in your area and will the unit work in the area of your home, of your child's school, et cetera? Does the system involve to train emergency response personnel? Some of them do, some of them are monitored. So if it gets activated, you're gonna get a first responder. Is the manufacturer accessible in case you have critical questions or challenges? What are the costs involved? Are there monthly fees? And is that something that is sustainable for you long-term? Okay, now let's talk about using identifying information. So you can also get ID bracelets, shoe tags, ID cards, and temporary tattoos with your child's name and phone number in them. This can help ensure your child's safe return if they run away or wander. These are things that you can order on Amazon, uh, Alert Me Bands, and temporary tattoos with a purpose, also safety tags. So if you look at any of those, you will find identifying information. So if you take a look at the pictures on the screen, um, there's an ID card, an example of an, a couple of ID cards. So you can include your child's photo, their name, their date of birth, what you call them, a contact number, a contact person, whatever information you want to include on it, you can include. And then the information you don't want to include, you don't have to include it. You can find another template or another um, ID badge. Um, you can even have something that's as simple as, I'm not misbehaving, I have autism, please be patient with me. Or you can have an actual ID band or, or um, ID card with all of the information necessary to get in touch with you if your child were to wander away. Here are some examples of Alert Me wristbands. It has contact details and important information. These can communicate critical information like I have autism, I am nonverbal, I get very fidgety when I'm anxious, etc. Contact information as well. So if you are in public or you're in a crowd and your child does happen to get away from you and are approached by somebody, if they have a bracelet like this, people are going to understand why your child might not be responding to their questions or might be engaging in some stereotypic behavior, might be stimming because they're upset and anxious and lost. Um, so these can be very, very helpful in getting your child back to you. And obviously who to call in case of an emergency. Um, we also mentioned shoe tags. So shoe ID tags are especially good for kids who can't tolerate wearing an ID bracelet. So you can see an example of how the tag would be worn on the picture of the sneaker where it would go right on the laces. And you can see a close up of uh, the information that they can include in this kind of a shoe tag. Name, address, phone number, um, medical information like penicillin allergy, or I have autism, or I am nonverbal. Um, anything that you want to include on there, you can. Um, this is another um, like shoe tag kind of system. 
It's called Kiehl's Ice Card and Medical Alert System. It provides a safe, secure way for children to carry identifying card uh, at all times and in case of emergency card at all times. The Kiehl's card is located in a special pocket area of the Kiehl's shoe insert and is accessible only when needed. So you would get this system and it actually, it's an insert that goes inside your child's shoe. So they won't even know that it's there, but it will be alerted on the outside. Like there is a tag that goes on the outside of the shoe. So if your child is lost and somebody sees the tag on the shoe, they'll know to go inside to this insert and get the information they need so they can, again, alert you and, let, and get your child back to you. You can get a shoelace charm, a waterproof permanent sticker for shoes without laces, reads emergency, uh, excuse me, uh, emergency contact information card in shoe insert. Okay, other identifying information, temporary tattoos, lost and found and temporary tattoos. Some kids will find a way to remove anything that you put on them, tracking devices, bands, etc. So another clever way to provide them with the critical information that will be needed if they get lost are lost and found tattoos. Safety tat uh, is a fun and colorful temporary safety tattoo. When applied to the arm of your child, Safety Tat provides an immediate, highly visible form of child identification. And again, you can see the examples on the screen. If lost, please call blank. Uh, again, other uh, examples of ID cards. The autism ID card, if you Googled that, will help people on the autism spectrum explain their medical condition to police, EMTs, and other first responders in case of an emergency. So if this card is on your child's person or in their wallet, um, again, God forbid of an emergency, the first responder would understand why your child may not be responding in a way that they were expecting them to respond. Okay, now let's talk about some clinical strategies because the best way to keep your child from eloping is to teach them not to elope in the first place, right? That's the best way to keep them safe. So let's talk about some different clinical strategies. We'll discuss each one in greater detail, but here's the overall vision. First, you wanna teach alternative behaviors and communication strategies. We are gonna discuss wandering versus exit seeking. We're gonna learn and practice de-escalation techniques, social stories, teaching your child safety related skills, scheduling access time, teach the timer, proximity and check-in training, consistent consequences. And we're gonna discuss each one of these in greater detail. So let's talk about teaching alternative behaviors and communication strategies. So teaching your child to react, respond and modify their behavior to remain safe is just as important as taking steps to safely secure the physical space of your home. Some helpful tools include trying to get to a preferred location. So if your child elopes in order to get to a place that they love, teach them to request access to those preferred locations. This can be done through verbals, picture cues, an augmentative device, et cetera. And if, it's not, if they ask and it's not a good time to go to the park or wherever their special place is, their asking provides you the opportunity to redirect them towards another activity. So we can't go to the park right now. Let's do some puzzles and we can go when you're done. Or we can't go to the park today because it's raining, but we can do blank instead. And now you can take the time to engage your child in another activity. Escaping in an unwanted task. So if your child elopes to get out of something, an unwanted demand like homework or something that you're asking them to do that they don't want to do, you can teach them to ask for a break. You can teach them to ask for some help with what they're working on. So even though unwanted tasks can't always be avoided, you can make them less stressful by breaking them into more manageable chunks. Initially, if your child is just starting to ask for a break, give it. Like Initially, it's more important to teach your child that this alternative behavior will work for them. You don't have to run away to get out of doing blank. 
you can just ask for a break and I will give you a break. I, it might be a quick break and I might reintroduce this again in a few minutes, but you're gonna learn that this works for you because if the only thing that really works consistently is running, then that's what they're gonna keep doing. But if there is something else that will work for them, and running becomes so much more difficult because of all these other strategies and supports we've put in place, then they'll be more likely to use this communicative strategy to, to get their needs met. They might be escaping an overwhelming stimulus. So your child might run away when they feel overwhelmed. In this case, we want to work on teaching them coping strategies. So if they run away from like noisy family gatherings, you can teach them to find a quiet space to calm down. Um, you could also teach them that they have to participate for a brief period of time and then they can go. So I mentioned before, my nephew has autism. So during family parties for a very long time, he didn't want to be a part of them and would need to be by himself. But my sister would make him come out for designated periods of time. So you have to come out for 20 minutes and talk to at least three different people, and then you can take another break. And then he would come and ask, is it 20 minutes yet? Can I go in my room yet? No, 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 you still have to talk to two more people. Oh, you got one more person to talk to and three more minutes to go, and then you can take another break. Okay, it's time. He would go take his break. And after a period of time, she would go knock on his door. Okay, time to come back out again, do another 20 minute round. We didn't start with 20 minutes. We started with like two minutes and then five minutes and then 12 minutes and then 15 minutes and then 20 minutes and we built up. And now he actually just started college. I've been giving him driving lessons. He's uh, like I said, just started the his freshman semester at college and I couldn't be prouder of him. During his senior year in high school, he was the lead in the school musical and in other, uh, he participated in other school plays, but he was um, the lead in um, A Little Shop of Horrors eat your heart out, Rick Moranis, suddenly Seymour, he was great. So, all, and he didn't speak until he was almost five. He was always in constant distress. He had sensory issues. He got speech, OT, PT, um, behavior plans. This is the, the, the child that I said hid, uh, took his toy to school and hid under the stairs for like 40 minutes so he could play with his electronic toys. Yes, he just started college. So all things are possible. So if your child is escaping an overwhelming stimulus, give them a designated spot that they can go to and designated amount of time for which they can escape and exactly what's expected of them while they're participating in that event. Your child might be eloping to express strong emotions. So if your child seems to be eloping because they're expressing a strong emotion, teach them ways to communicate that to you or another adult. If they're verbal, they can learn to talk about their emotions. If they're nonverbal, they can use pictures or other ver visuals to express their feelings so you can help them cope with those emotions. Okay, we don't expect them not to have strong emotions, but you don't have to run away because of it. We also want to teach alternative behaviors. So how do you respond when you're lost? Teach your child how to respond if they get lost. You show your wristband to a grown-up you hand them your ID card. Um, and you might wanna teach them to respond to a variety of cues. What's your name? Are you supposed to be here? Do you have any ID? Are you lost? Do you know where you are? Do you know where your mom is? Is everything okay? Like to all of those questions, they should respond the same way. Hand them on their ID card, show the wristband, say I'm lost whatever communicative strategy will be successful for your child. Practice it. Show them pictures of police officers, men and women, young and old, multiracial. That way, no matter who your child encounters, they will understand that is the person I should go and ask for help or a grown up. So again, like I just stated, teach a variety of responses to a variety of different questions because you don't want your child to only respond to, give me your ID. And then somebody says, are you lost, sweetie? Is everything okay? And your child does not know what to do. So let's talk a little bit about wandering versus exit seeking. 
are your, is your child prone to wandering or are they exit seeking? There's a difference. So determining if your child is more prone to wanting to leave environments rather than aimlessly wandering out of them can be a good way to assess which proactive and preventative strategies can be taken. So if you have a child who's more prone to wandering, you might want to take walks with them so they can get their energy out in a safe way. That's different than exit seeking, which is there's something that I don't want to do and I want to get away from it, right? You place the demand, I don't want to follow, I'm going to exit. There's a crowd of people here that's unpredictable. I'm going to seek an exit. I'm overwhelmed by the crowd or the noise or the behavioral or social or language demands and I'm going to seek an exit. That's different from just I have a lot of energy and I like to move around a lot and I just kind of wander and kind of flit from here to there to here to there to here to there. That's a lot different than actively seeking an exit from something that you don't want to do. Depending on what your child is doing might determine which strategies are better or worse for you to use in the moment. You want to teach your child and you want to practice relaxation strategies, because as we've been talking about, elopement means your child's in some kind of distress more often than not, unless they're just wandering because they want to access something that they like. But if they're exit seeking, it's because they're in some kind of distress, they're anxious, they're overwhelmed in some way. An escalation in, in a person's behavior because of a lot of factors can lead to elopement. So you wanna practice de-escalation techniques, bringing things down before they get so out of control that you have to wait for them to pass. There's a, an interval of time during which you can intervene. Once a behavior has gone past that level, you have to wait for it to peak and come down on its own. After a certain point, it's a non-teachable moment and you can't really intervene at that point. You have to just wait for it to pass and then there'll be another opportunity for you to intervene again. So when you're first noticing the slightest bit of agitation from your child, that's where you start to use these de-escalation techniques, which could include deep belly breathing, not chest breathing, but belly breathing. You could practice this by placing your hand on your belly. And when you inhale, your hand should move out and when you inhale, when you exhale, your hand should move out. When you, I'm sorry, you inhale, you're filling your diaphragm, your hand should move out. When you exhale, you're blowing out, your hand should move in. So it's like a balloon, your diaphragm, okay? When you're inhaling, you're filling it with air, which should move your hand out. When you're blowing out, the balloon is going down, your hand should move in, okay? That's how you know you're breathing from your diaphragm. That has been clinically and scientifically shown to slow your heartbeat, and help calm you down. If you're breathing from your chest and you're doing a lot of rapid breathing from your chest, that sends a signal to your brain that you're in distress and that you might be drowning or suffocating. Or, so that amps up your heart rate. If you take deep belly breaths, diaphragm breathing, that sends a signal to your brain to slow your heart down and to calm everything down, okay? So belly breathing is important. You might want to do a little yoga, sing a song, offer a reward incentive, take a walk with your child, maybe get out some energy that way, grab a snack, go to a quiet room where it's not so overwhelming and you can help your child calm down or talk them through something. Use deep pressure or weighted items to help with calming. Count to 100. When you're doing these deep belly breaths, Sometimes my students kind of feel like I did three breaths and I'm not feeling calmer, so this doesn't work. Get to 100, do 100 breaths. Count one in, two out, three in, four out, five in, six, so seven inhale, eight exhale, nine inhale, 10 exhale. By the time you get to 100, you should feel much calmer, okay? Even if you don't get to 100, if you get to 50, you'll feel much calmer. But the point is, don't expect it to happen after four or five breaths. Give it a little time. So count to 100, maybe do some breathing during that time. Or do progressive muscle relaxation. What that means is, first you tense, 
your muscles. So I'm going to start with my hands. Okay. You tense, 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 then relax as much as you can. Relax, relax, relax. Then I'm going to move up to my arms. Tense, 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 then relax as much as possible. Breathe in and breathe out and relax those muscles. Then maybe go to your torso. Tighten, 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 tighten all the muscles. Then breathe and relax all the muscles. So you move from one muscle group to the next, all the way down your body. Start your feet, work all the way up. Start at your head, work all the way down. Start in the center, work out. Start at your extremities, work in. Whatever works for you, okay? But you're tightening and then relaxing each group of muscles one at a time till your whole body becomes more relaxed. And again, you can look up information and scripts for progressive muscle relaxation. Another strategy, clinical strategy you can use includes social stories. These are stories with pictures and texts that can be used to help explain a situation and expected behavior by providing step-by-step -step instructions. You can customize a social story yourself by using pictures your child will recognize to help your child know what to do in order to stay safe in various situations, or you can purchase pre-made social stories, like some of the ones that are listed on your page on the screen here, um, include, I stay in my house, if I get lost, water safety, and stop. So you can buy pre-made books, social stories, or you can make your own and individualize them for your child and your child's needs and the language and pictures that your child will understand. You can go to Twigtail. Autism Speaks has collaborated with Twigtail to develop teaching stories to help keep your child safe. You provide the personal details and they provide the scripted stories. So these books, Water Safety, I Stay in My House, Police Officer, My Friend, If I Get Lost, will be personalized with your child's information in the story itself, which is always very, very cool for your child. We also want to teach safety related behaviors. Okay, this is a very important clinical strategy is to actually teach safety related behaviors. Your child has to learn safety skills that can help keep them safe across settings, whether they're home or at school or in the community. The specific safety goals you'll address will depend on your child's specific needs, okay? Their tendency to wander, whether they have an impaired sense of danger, their attraction to water, etc. Part of the danger of elopement occurs when children can't communicate important information or they don't respond when someone says stop. So practice skills like that, right? Work on having them walk, say stop and having them stop. Okay, and then reward them for stopping. Initially, you might have to walk next to them. You physically stop as you say stop and physically block your child from moving forward. Wait a second, say, oh, good, you stopped and give them a, a reinforcer or a reward, either an edible or a token or a point or whatever is motivating for your child. Then you want to systematically feed your physical prompts and do it from a distance, okay, till your child can follow that direction. You also want to teach them things like answering what's your name, answering their phone number, or in response to those questions, showing an ID card. You want to teach your child how to cross the street safely. Teach your child about road crossing, safely crossing the street, depending on where you live and what the bet if you have stop lights and walk don't walk signs, or if you're in a more residential or more rural environment, um, again, practice crossing the street with your child when you can teach them and prompt them and reward them for appropriate behavior and safe behavior. Okay, let's talk about some additional safety related behaviors. It's very, very important to teach your child to swim. Many children with autism are attracted to water, making elopement near bodies of water extremely dangerous. Consider putting your child in swimming lessons to cut down on the risk this behavior presents. Teaching your child to swim does not mean your child is automatically safe in water, but it will help. If you own a pool, fence your pool, use gates that self-close and self-latch higher than your child's reach. Remove all toys or items of interest from the pool while not in use. 
my brother almost drowned when we were very little because there was a pool toy floating in the pool. It wasn't time to swim. We were at a friend's house and he was real little at the time. And the adults were occupied. I think the women were cooking and the guys were, my, my dad and his friend were doing some work uh, with, I don't know, tools, cutting and sawing or something. They were building something. And my brother just happened to notice this pool toy floating. And I saw it, the look in his eyes. I just knew he was going to run and jump and try and grab that toy. And he didn't know how to swim. He was like a toddler. He was real, real, real little. And I yelled for help. And my dad went and jumped in. And sure enough, he dove in, tried to get the pool toy. And had we not been vigilantly watching him, he could have drowned. So if you know, you know, you have a pool, take those toys out of the pool. They can be really, really tempting for your child to think I'm just going to jump and land on this and I'm going to be safe, or I'm just going to reach over and grab it, not realize they're going to fall in or lose their balance. Or it might look a little closer and as it starts to drift further away, they can reach and accidentally fall in. Neighbors with pools should be made aware of these safety precautions and your child's tendency to wander. Final lesson should be with clothes and shoes on if your child is taking swimming lessons because if they accidentally fall into a body of water, they will have their clothes and their shoes on. And it's much different to swim when you're dressed and you have shoes on than when you're in a bathing suit and you don't have shoes on. So it's important to practice all of these things with your child. God forbid they happen to get away and they do fall in a body of water, they'll they, it won't be new to them to swim with their clothes on and their shoes on. To find swimming lessons in your area, visit nationalautism.org, click on autism and safety, and then choose swimming instructions. And you will be, um, you will find uh, swimming lessons in your area sponsored by Autism Speaks. If you do not see swimming lessons in your area, Google special needs swimming lessons plus your city and state. You can also contact Autism Speaks if you need to, and they will help find a safety uh, swimming uh, lessons in your area, or they might even develop a program if there is enough interest. Scheduling access time. If your child is eloping because they have a unique fascination or, oh, let me just go back for a minute. When I said many children with autism are attracted to water, that's really, really true. A lot of kids with autism love water. It's a sensory thing. When you're in a body of water, you're getting equal pressure on every part of your body at the same time by the water pressing in on your body. So that for kids that have sensory needs and sensory issues, it's very, very comforting for a lot of kids, which is why so many kids with autism are really attracted to being in the water. So it's extremely important that they know how to swim. I'm sorry, I just wanted to run back and say that really quickly. Okay, now let's talk about scheduling access time. If your child is eloping because they have a specific fascination or they're drawn to a particular activity, drawn to water, to pools, to lakes, to the park, to the dog park, to your neighbor's house, to a specific car on the park down the block, you can allow your child to have access to those fascinations in an adult supervised controlled setting. Find ways to incorporate this fascination into daily activities so your child knows when to expect it. And they'll know that they don't have to elope and escape in order to access it. They'll know it's coming. Use drawings, pictures, games, videos, other creative ways to satisfy the child's need to touch or explore items or activities of obsession. There are a lot of apps, there are a lot of videos, there are a lot of, you, you can find pretty much anything these days. So schedule some access time, make it virtual if you can't make it actually physical, do the best you can until you can actually schedule physical access time. You can create a visual schedule so that your child specifically knows exactly when they can access those activities of obsession. For example, if your child is fascinated by water, you might have consistent water play times each day or at the same time each week or both. Schedule around times that are easily recognized 
such as after dinner or before bath time. And then your child will start to anticipate and expect that uh, instead of having to rely on looking at the schedule. So they'll know, oh, we're eating dinner. As soon as we, we're done, I know I'm gonna get my water table time. Or as soon as we're done, I know we're gonna go for a walk around the block. Make sure that the child sees that the activity has an end time and is all done at that point. So now let's talk about teaching the timer. Teaching your child that the sound of a timer means that they're gonna do something different can be very, very helpful for you and your child. They can learn that they'll only have access to a preferred item or activity for a limited amount of time. They'll also learn that they only need to tolerate non-preferred items or activities until the timer sounds. The non-preferred activity or condition will not last forever. Like I said with my nephew, you only have to be social for five minutes, then you can be alone for 20 minutes. Then you can be social for 10 minutes, then you can be alone for 30 minutes, whatever it happens to be. If they're eloping towards a preferred item or activity, you can teach them that they'll have access to that item or activity for a designated period of time or that it's scheduled into their day or into their week. Once they know they can access that item or activity with predictability, they no longer need to elope to gain access to it. Teach that after they request the item or activity appropriately, they'll get access for a limited amount of time. If they're eloping away from a non-preferred activity or item, you can teach them that they only need to tolerate that thing that they don't like for a very short period of time. And then you're gonna do something else. So it teaches them that the non-preferred thing isn't gonna last forever. It's only, you only have to tolerate it for a short amount of time, and then you're gonna get a break from it. That's going to make it less likely that they're gonna to escape to get away from it because they're gonna see, it's counting down. I'm almost done. Okay. I don't have to run away to get away from it. I will get away from it. Proximity training and check-in training. So this is another clinical strategy that you can use. So first, you want to have a functional assessment done to determine the reasons for elopement. So you want to write down the behaviors that precede and follow every attempt or occurrence of elopement. So what happens right before my child elopes and what happens right after my child elopes? Write it down. Keep that. Now look for a pattern. That helps us determine the function. Now, once we've figured out why it's happening, you can reinforce your child for remaining within a designated proximity, like staying in this room or staying within four feet or within arm's reach for increasing durations. Again, timer. First, you only have to stay in right next to me for 30 seconds, and then you get a break for five minutes. Now you come back. You have to stay here for 30 seconds, then you get a break for five minutes. Or you stay here for one minute and get a break for five minutes, or you stay here for five minutes and you get a break for 10 minutes, whatever it happens to be. Teach your child to check in with you at fixed intervals, like every two minutes, every five minutes during periods of low supervision. So like I was saying before, if you are making dinner and you want your child to stay in the playroom, you've set up some barriers, to keep them in the playroom, okay? Now you can set a timer. And every time that timer goes off, your child is going to check in with you. So they're going to go to the door and just say, hey, ma. Okay. That way, you know, or if, the, if there is no barrier, that they're going to actually come keep them in the same room as you. And when that timer goes off, they're going to come over and tap you on the arm and check in with you. That way, you know, your child is coming and checking in with you instead of you having to go and check on them. You wanna deliver very potent reinforcement for checking in. That can counteract any motivation to wander. So if you're reinforcing them with something that they want more than they just want to wander, this will work for you. If your child does wander, you'll be aware of it immediately because they failed to check in. So if you hear that check-in timer go off and your child hasn't come and checked in with you and you're hearing that timer go off, that's your cue. Go look for your child. They're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. What are they doing instead? And now you can correct that. A vibrating alarm that could be carried in the child's pocket can be their prompt to seek you out and check in or 
can be worn as a watch or can be stuck in their pocket. So you can get alarms or timers that vibrate. You can get timers that light up, whatever. You can get a variety of different kinds of timers. So you can put that vibrating timer on your child's wrist or in your child's pocket and just teach them when that goes off, they come and find you. And then you stop it, you turn it on again. And then when it goes off, they come and find you and they get a really, really powerful reward every time they come and find you. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about modeling and role playing. You wanna practice desired behavior and variations on specific details to practice ways to act safely in realistic situations. So like I was saying before, if you're going to expect your child to use an ID card, if somebody asks them for their identification or if they get lost and they can't say their name, phone number and, and your contact information reliably, and you want them to be able to give an ID card or show a wristband, you have to practice all the various ways that somebody could ask them for that information. You don't wanna just teach them, can I please see your ID card? Because if somebody comes over and says, it doesn't matter, honey, are you lost? They won't know what to do. So role-playing and modeling, any variations that you can think of can be really, really helpful in teaching your child what to do in the actual situation when it happens. Be Safe the Movie, which you can order, uses video modeling to teach viewers how to interact safely with the police. The video teaches people with autism what to do in different police encounters, ranging from a casual meeting to an arrest which hopefully your child will never have to experience. But if they do, you need them to know what to do so they are safe. Unfortunately, there are too many occurrences where an officer felt threatened by somebody's behavior and that person was hurt or killed unnecessarily when something else could have been done. We don't want that to happen in this situation. So. Video modeling can be very helpful in order to teach your child what to expect and what they should and shouldn't do in certain scenarios. Utilize consistent consequences across all settings. So no matter where your child is, the same consequence occurs. Consistent reinforcement for safe behavior across all settings. Every time your child is safe, they get something really potent and powerful. Anytime they use any of these strategies that you've taught them, you want to reinforce them with something really powerful so they're more likely to do it again in the natural scenario when they're anxious and upset. You have to practice when you're calm. When you're upset, when you're agitated, when you're escalated, you're not thinking clearly, okay? When your child is escalated and agitated, they're not thinking clearly. So if they're not able to do these behaviors when they are thinking clearly, they definitely won't be able to do them when they're under stress. So make sure your child can do this consistently, calmly, and then you can practice it under stress, under different stressful situations to make sure that they really can use those skills. And again, you wanna have consistent consequences for unsafe behavior across all settings too. So if they don't, blank, whatever that show the ID bracelet, or they do try to leave the house, or they try to take the alarm off the door, whatever it is that they're doing, you have to have a consistent consequence that you use every single time. So if you know you cannot take the iPad away from your child for a whole day, don't tell them that if they elope, you're going to take the iPad away for a whole day. You have to use consequences that you know you can stick to. Okay, let's talk about an emergency plan for your family. This is really, really important. You have, you have an eloper in your household. You have to develop an emergency plan for your family. You want to share your emergency plan. Okay, so let's, we're going to go over each one of these in details. You want to ice for autism. We're going to discuss that. Wearable tracking devices, flyers and leaflets, the find them scent kit, alert your child's school, and now let's talk about each one of these strategies in greater detail. Okay, developing an emergency plan for your family is vital. Emergencies happen, so you have to have a plan in advance because like I just said, in an emergency, you are not thinking clearly. So if you have an emergency plan already thought out when you are thinking clearly, 
you'll know exactly what to do. So this emergency plan should specify what is each adult's role? Who is gonna call whom? Who is gonna do what? What is your role in that emergency? It's better to be proactive and have all this information and a plan in place ahead of time. You don't wanna develop it in the moment. So how will you and your spouse or partner get in touch with each other? What calls will be made? The police, neighbors, neighborhood watch, grandma and grandpa, Aunt Sally, Uncle Joe, and by whom? Who will call each one of those people and in which order? Which places should be checked first? Dangerous places, preferred places, etc. Here is an example of a family wandering emergency plan. So there is a place, okay, so for the child's name, uh, communication information, emergency steps, all of the information about what your, how your child communicates, what might escalate their behavior, what might de-escalate their behavior, what things they're interested in, what places they might be attracted to, who to contact once you do find them. All of this is already specified in this emergency plan, okay? So there are a variety of different ones. Again, if you just Google family emergency plan elopement, you will find a lot of these templates and you can fill any one of them out, okay? You, there's even a place to put a current picture of your child on there as well. You wanna share your emergency plan. So anybody who is a caregiver of your child should be aware of what the emergency plan is. Babysitters, caregivers, your child's school, anybody who takes care of your child should be fluent in this plan. You need to detail when to call 911, what to do when your child is found, any other important information. Always search nearby water and busy streets first since they can pose such an immediate risk. Okay, so now let's talk about ICE for autism, okay? This is the only autism specific in case of emergency mobile app. It easily stores vital information about your child's unique and individual needs directly on your iPhone or iPad, making the information for first responders or ER personnel immediately available. ICE for Autism also includes an alert my emergency contacts feature, which sends an emergency alert text message to the user's emergency contacts. So that may be how you contact your spouse or partner or parents or whoever it is you need to contact. Wearable tracking devices, as we've discussed already, um, you might consider getting your child a wearable tracking device, which can allow you to track your child on your phone, which we've discussed. You can see examples there on wrist wearables, on a vest that has a GPS tracker, on a belt that has a, a wearable GPS tracker. And we also discussed those uh, things that go on your shoes and things of that nature. Flyers and leaflets. You want to keep up to date information, cards and leaflets about your child that you can distribute in case of an emergency. You can give these to neighbors, to first responders, to caregivers, to anybody else necessary if your child elopes. So you want to include information like a picture of your child, your child's name, the calming methods that work for your child, necessary medical information if there are allergies or food preferences, et cetera, physical description, Again, a picture, emergency contact, any applicable tracking information. So if you have a GPS tracker or that shoe insert or anything, favorite places, favorite things, don't. So don't touch them, don't shout at them, don't move quickly, anything that might escalate behavior that you know is a trigger for your child, include on this flyer as well. Here are some examples of flyers and leaflets. So again, you can search autism elopement alert form, um, emergency profile form elopement, autism safety elopement profile, emergency form, anything like that. As you can see, some of them have pecs on the bottom. Um, they have a lot of different templates or you can just make one yourself. Okay, the find them scent kit, providing your child's personal scent to search and rescue. First responders saves valuable time in an emergency. The canine bloodhound tracking dogs will have an uncontaminated scent to track, which makes it more likely they will have a successful outcome and safe recovery. So if you Google search the find them scent kit, 
you can get a copy of this kit where you can get a, a, a sample of your child's scent, which will be kept in this kit on file. So again, God forbid your child goes missing and you need dogs to track your child, you will have an uncontaminated scent that you can use that'll make it most likely that they will be able to find your child quickly and safely. You also want to alert your child's school. Remember at the beginning of the presentation when we discussed how a third of all elopements occur from your child's school or classroom? So we need to alert your child's school. You can leave them some of those leaflets that we've mentioned and discuss the emergency plan with them. Ask what your school's policy on wandering prevention are. Write a letter requesting that you always be informed in writing of any wandering incident in or out of the building. You would think that would be a given, but it's not. If it's not on your child's IEP or a part of your child's plan, you may not be told if there was an attempt to elope or if there was a short elopement when they found your child and everything was okay really quickly. So you wanna make sure that you put it in writing, that you are to be informed in writing of any attempts or occurrences of elopement at school. If your child is an active wanderer and poses safety risks, consider addressing those needs in your child's IEP. There are sections for this, okay? So you can put this in your IEP if needed. And if your child is an eloper, it's needed. Take note of all architectural barriers, fences, doors, security systems, um, doors that lock around the school, daycare or camp, or the lack thereof. Make your facility aware if, there, if there's a hole in the fence or if anybody could walk in and out of any door. Make them aware that this is a problem. You need to know that they're going to protect your child to the best of their ability as well. So you have to make them aware of this. And if it's in your IEP, then they are legally bound to do it. So put it in the IEP. So here's an example of a sample wandering prevention letter, a couple of prevention uh, and um, an alert IEP letter, where again, you're making your child's needs known and letting them know exactly what you expect them to do about it. And you can make this part of their IEP as well. So we can provide um, uh, access to these samples. Again, if you just Google sample school alert, IEP elopement letter, sample wandering prevention letter, autism elopement. If you, that's how I found these. I searched for them and I was able to get these pictures as examples for you. I have a lot of these in my files that we just made ourselves, but I wanted to show you um, examples of templates that are out there already. So again, here are um, things that you can print out and share with your child's school. Um, here is, again, the same kind of emergency information form that you filled out for your child at home, they can fill out at school. And you can go on Autism Speaks to print out seven steps to prevent wandering at school. And you can share this with your child's school. And you can put this again in their IEP that everybody who works with your child gets a copy of this. These are examples of safety goals that can be included in a behavior plan or IEP responding to a ch the child's name, responding to questions about personal information like their name, address, telephone number, et cetera, requesting help when lost, safely crossing the street, identifying boundaries, don't leave the classroom, the house, the yard, the playground, et cetera, refrain from running away or bolting, get sensory needs met in an appropriate way. You can have any or all of these goals put on your child's IEP, learning water safety, requesting attention and fun interactions. So sometimes eloping becomes a game of chase me. You can just teach your child to request chase me or to have a race or to play chase. That's okay. We don't want it to become a game. You want to alert first responders. So we can prepare first responders as best we can. Contact your local police precinct, Project Lifesaver and Safety Net Tracking System programs, Smart 911, and we will discuss each of these in detail. So preparing first responders. Again, if you have completed those um, emergency plans, you can share copies with them with first responders. 
it's important for first responders to be prepared by knowing which children in the community might wander, having that family contact information and having a plan to respond. Tools and training materials are available through the AWARE with two A's, well, three A's total organization, through Autism Speak Safety Project, and the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. You can contact any of these organizations in order to provide training to first responders in your area. You want to contact your local police department. Many local police departments train their officers to support families with children with special needs. Contact your local precinct. Do you know what your local precinct is? If you have a child who's an eloper, you should. Contact them. If possible, arrange to introduce your child to the local police officers. That way you establish contact and familiarity. If they know you, if they know your child, if your child knows them, everybody's gonna feel more comfortable if they do have to interact. Contact your local police department. Some of the things that you may wanna inform them about. Does your child have an impaired sense of danger? Might they wander to water, traffic, dogs? other dangers? Do they have delayed speech and language skills? Do they use alternative or augmentative methods of communication? Do they not respond to their name or to verbal commands? Do they avoid eye contact? Do they engage in stereotypic or repetitive behavior like rocking or hand flapping or stimming? Do they mimic phrases or words? If you don't alert the police to this, they might think that your child is being fresh, right? Do they have sensory perception issues? Do they not understand personal space, right? That's a really important thing for a first responder to know. If your child is gonna run up to them and hug them, they need to know that. They might perceive that as an assault. You know your child might be safe. You know your child might not be trying to hurt them, or maybe your child does have aggressive behavior when they get upset. These are important things for the first responders to be alerted of. You want them to know they're not trying to hurt you because they're trying to hurt you. They're just upset and anxious in the moment because they don't understand. Your little child will eventually become your big kid and eventually your teenager and your young adult and your adult. And you need to be aware of how they may be perceived by people who are trying to help them. And that could escalate to a more dangerous situation. Does your child have epilepsy or a seizure disorder? Do they fear people in uniforms or are they curious about people in uniforms or are they interested in guns? Do they tend to reach and grab for things that they want or shiny objects or handcuffs or things like that? That's very, very important. Do they hide in tight, small spaces, which again is important for a first responder to know. All of that can be put on that information sheet that we were talking about making that flyer, but you should introduce to the precinct, include all that information, maybe bring a copy of that with you. Smart 911, this is a great, great system that I had previously not been aware of. Smart 911 allows citizens to provide additional details that 911 call takers may need in order to assist them during an emergency. With Smart 911, anytime you make an emergency call from a phone registered with your safety profile, the 911 system recognizes your phone number and automatically displays your profile on the screen of the call taker who receives your call. You can include medical details for any member of your household, enabling responders to have more information before they arrive on scene. This includes information on medical conditions, allergies, disabilities, medications, etc. At a time when you may be panicked or unable to communicate, or it could be unsafe to communicate, Smart 911 ensures the details you would need to tell your 911 are immediately available in the event you cannot verbally provide them. Smart 911 is free, private, and secure. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Project Lifesaver and safety net tracking programs. So this is implemented by professionally trained emergency response personnel. Project Lifesaver provides equipment, training, certification, and support to law enforcement, public safety organizations, and community groups throughout the nation. Check to see if there's a Project Lifesaver 
or safety net tracking system in your area for Project Lifesaver, visit projectlifesaver.org and click on where we are link to enter your zip code. For safety net tracking, visit safetynettracking.com and enter your zip code in the check availability field. If there is no first responder tracking program in your area, call Project Lifesaver International at 877-580-5433 or 877-580-LIFE. Or for safety net tracking, call 877-434-6384 and request informational materials be sent to your address. Now, considerations to remember. Will your child be okay wearing a device or will they try to remove it? Does it need to be water resistant? Is the mobile network in the areas your child frequents working consistently? Lots of the devices use geotracking. Is it battery operated? And if so, how long does the battery last? Is your child always at risk of eloping or are there specific situations that make it more likely that they will elope? Does your child have favorite hiding spots both inside and outside the home that they visit when they're stressed or when they want to explore? Okay, summary and checklist. So you can make a caregiver checklist tool. Again, this is available. I'm going to have to give you resources. This is available at bigredbox.com. This will give you a checklist of all of the things that we've discussed, all the things that you can go through and just check them off one at a time that you made your emergency plan, you made your flyer, et cetera, et cetera. And here is a safety and wandering prevention checklist that you can pr print out from Autism Speaks. Again, go to Autism Speaks and search safety and wandering prevention, and you can print this out for yourselves. Now, the Big Red Safety Box is a free of charge toolkit. You might be asked to pay $8 for shipping, but it, it's really given to autism families in need as a means to educate, to raise awareness and provide simple tools that may assist them in preventing and responding to wandering related emergencies. NAA's Big Red Safety Box includes the following resources. Again, for either free or $8 in shipping, you will get educational materials and tool, tools, including NAA's Big Red Booklet, oh, Be Ready Booklet, sorry. Two, count them, two, battery operated door and window alarms, including the batteries, one road ID bracelet or shoe ID tag. You'll receive instructions in the box to submit your custom personalization order with your name and phone number. Five adhesive stop sign visual prompts for your doors and windows. Two safety alert window clings for your car or home windows. One child ID kit from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. To apply for an NAA Big Red Safety Box, you must be the primary caregiver of an individual with an autism diagnosis, be 18 years or older and a resident of the United States, agree to the terms and conditions stated in the application, be a first time recipient, you can't continue to get them over and over again, Apply only once. Multiple requests will not be processed. It limits one box per family. Allow up to three weeks to have your application reviewed and to get your box delivered. Nationalautismassociation.org. And there is the website address for you. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about how we can continue to help you. Not only do we provide workshops like this, but we provide ongoing support. As you can see through this presentation, there are a lot of components to consider if your child is an eloper. There are a lot of safety issues. There are a lot of strategies. There are a lot of clinical interventions. There's a lot to do. And there are a lot of variables to consider. So you might attend a workshop like tonight and think to yourself, I need help implementing strategies like that. This is what we're here for, okay? We're here to help. So first way we can help is by providing workshops like this. So here are a variety of resources where you can get information, where I got a lot of the information for tonight's 
presentation. Here are all of the websites where you can get general information, information on swimming lessons, information on child safety products like the Big Red Safety Shop, tracking systems, IDs, and home security products, service dogs, etc. Here's all the information that you need. And if you need to come back to the video presentation and, and revisit these websites, please feel free to do so. They are all here for you to help. That is what we are here for. Now, we are aware that it can be difficult to implement all of these strategies along the way. We want to be there to help you. One of the things that Michelle had said at the beginning in her video was how she had to change her mindset and kind of get out of her own way. We're there to help with that too. This can seem really, really overwhelming. And it seems even more overwhelming when, when you feel like you're on your own. Having access to us ensures that you're not alone. So if you, according to Autism Speaks, the cost of caring for an individual on the autism spectrum over the course of their lifetime, as of now, this is only gonna go up, can be $1.4 million over the course of an individual's lifetime. Now that's considering things like communication devices, iPad, apps, software, AEC devices, diapers if your child is not potty trained for life, ABA therapy, speech therapy, OT, PT, food therapy, therapy for you. This isn't including supplies, materials, visuals, printer paper, ink, um, sibling support, marriage counseling, and the trillion other things that come up, safety beds, ID bracelets, all of these things, right? All of this stuff, really piles up, costs a lot of money. If you look at just what's here, not even including the things that are, I left off this list that I just mentioned, this is $8,400 a month or uh, $101,000 a year. I don't know about you, but I can't afford laying out $101,000 a year. So signing up for our master class provides you a three-month group coaching program with guaranteed results. We're going to talk about that. What you get for you and your child, you get foundation skills to help you build an independent life for your child. You get a personalized potty training plan for your child. You gain, your, your, your child gains communication and you get the tools to do it. You can eliminate tantruming and problem behaviors. You can interact together as a family as if your child doesn't have a disability. You can stop eloping from happening, which is the whole reason you came here tonight in the first place. You can get your child eating new foods, sleeping in their own bed, playing with their siblings, playing with their friends. So what we offer this is a three month group coaching program with guaranteed results. Okay, as part of this three month group class, you get education which means lifetime access to our masterclass self-study course. It gives you the tools, the tips, and the roadmap to get you and your child results. It gives you a community, a private Facebook community where every post gets personalized and tailored coaching by our team. Support is our North Star. And we really believe that. When you post on our Facebook group, all the BCBAs will jump in and, and, and comment on it. Our mindset coach will jump in on it. Our life coach will jump in on it. Um, sometimes the other parents will jump in and, and give suggestions and strategies and support and other people just to vent to and talk to. It's amazing what you can do when you have a community that supports you. And you get three live expert weekly coaching calls like this one with Michelle, our mindset coach and BCBAs like myself, where we build week over week to achieve the goals you have for your child. Unlike tonight, when we do our weekly coaching calls, we have a much shorter presentation and then we spend the whole rest of the evening just answering questions and providing coaching to you guys. Um, during our workshops, we present a little bit more information and then give you the information on how to access that on a regular basis. So in order to access the support, 
book a call with our team to learn how to work with us, how to feel confident and certain that you can help your child and you can see the results that you want for them. Like Michelle said in her video, that you can look yourself in the mirror and say, I did 100% today. And you can say that every single day. So to book your call, click on this link, go in the chat box, click on the link, or go to the website, championmoms.com slash call one. Again, that's championmoms, C-H-A-M-P-I-O-N-M-O-M-S dot com backslash call, C-A-L-L, the number one. Or you can email Stella at Michelle B. Rogers.com. So please click on this link, email Stella, book a call so that we can provide more access and more assistance to you guys on a week to week basis. The only way to get you there, to get you and your child to where you need to be is to allow us to be there to help you along the way when you need somebody to help with troubleshooting, when something isn't going exactly as planned, when something different happened than what we talked about during our, our group coaching call or during our workshop, and you're not sure about this different variation and how to handle it. We are there to help you every step of the way. So please listen to what some of our other parents have said about being part of our program. So uh, when you came to us, what were your biggest struggles prior to joining the program? And what was uh, your child's biggest struggles uh, before you came to us? First, a big one was potty training and speech. Um, like he had some words, but I couldn't really get him to fully tell me, you know, what he wanted. So those were always my two biggest concerns with him uh, and for him and me, I guess, so for both of us. This was the seven-year-old kid, he turned seven in July, who will pee and pretty much poop in his pull-ups. When you look at him, like, stuff, like, oh my God, something's got to be done. So we were not potty trained. We were not talking much. He wasn't able, if I told him to go get something, do any of those things. Behaviors were starting to become more prevalent where he was uh, becoming obstinate, stubborn, refusing to do the things we asked of him to the point where he was even, you know, destroying his room. Speech was a big thing because he wasn't talking. It was a lot of just silence. Nothing. I came in just feeling very helpless, very confused, um, alone, not knowing what to do to help my baby. By the time he was 21 to 22 months, he had lost all of his words and he was talking in phrases by about 22 months, no words left, very unengaged, no eye contact, doesn't answer to his name. Older was having meltdowns. Uh, the younger one was nonverbal and the verbal issues, communication issues. Since he was diagnosed uh, just before he turned three, and you kind of feel like you're left out on your own in the cold, and you want to do every single thing you can for your kids. Tell us what he's what he's done, what he's accomplished. How do you feel now versus where you were when you started? Um, he's totally potty trained. We go everywhere just in our undies. We don't have to worry about that. Um, he is speaking way more. When I called you at first, I was really overwhelmed. But now, hardly, I would say I never get overwhelmed, but I'm able to retreat. I really saw improvement. It was like day and night. I'll just rush to where we are now, where Joseph will just run to the bathroom to pee. Yeah. And it's not just pee. Joseph will run to the bathroom, and I'm like, where are you going? I'm chasing him, and he's going to the bathroom, pull his pants down, and he's doing number two. So that helped me a lot, helped me calm down and just focus on that. Um, so yeah, so focusing on getting him not scared of the toilet and then that took a little bit, you know, but now, but then he finally was sitting down doing it. Yeah, it went really well. Like all, again, the tips you guys gave me, all the potty stuff worked great. 
he was finally sitting down, going to the potty, and um, yeah, we're fully potty training. Each of you gave me something else that I didn't know or needed guidance in. You know, the BCBAs obviously gave me help in the technical work with Brandon and how to encourage language and behavior. Stella gave me the emotional support. You guys saved my family. I don't know. <laughs> how I got through as much as I did without you. He's doing so much better. More eye contact for sure. Um, we're working on, on talking, on saying some words, and just happier, you know, I think because I'm happier. More communication and potty training. And so when we started working together now, he is much more verbal. He's speaking in sentences. He kept reminding me to, you know, you can do this, you can do this, and... And we did. It has been fantastic. My son is thriving in um, an integrated preschool. And, you know, if I ever have any concerns, I can reach out to Michelle. She gets back to me right away. They're doing really, really well. Both are potty trained. I'd say 95% of the time um, doing really, really well. I think their ABA program here is, is, is wonderful. We got very lucky with that. And uh, we've got good vision for the future. All right, so then my last question for you is, would you recommend us to any other parents? Every single person that I have met I've already told them about you and your agency. Absolutely. Hands down of everything we've done, and you pulled that, this has been the best thing, just having so much support in the different areas. So absolutely, hands down, I would recommend this a million times over. I would definitely prefer anyone to this, because again, I, I never thought he was going to be potty trained. It's worth it, you know? Uh, I think anything, if you get just a little bit out of it, it's worth it, and I've gotten so much from this you know so do it do it do it is what i would say i will recommend you whoever has a child on the spectrum i will recommend michelle i mean if you have a chance to do this i definitely recommend it it has made all the difference thank you okay so i am going to take a look at i'm oh, sorry this okay. oh. I'm going to take a look first at the chat and Q&A. Okay, so David Clark here is asking where to get the tracking device. So as I mentioned on that last slide page that has all the resources there, there are plenty, of, there are a bunch of websites there where you can go and get the tracking and look for the tracking device. And earlier in the presentation, there was, I think it was AngelSense. Um, and if you just do a Google search for autism elopement tracking device, you are going to get more hits than you're even going to know what to do with. So you can then look through wearables, um, watches, belts, vests, whatever you think is going to work best for your child. Um, Latoya, good evening. Can I have I, can I have a copy of the different alarms? I cannot see the slides on my end. Um, yeah, I, I, I do believe that uh, we should be able to send you guys a copy of at least that resource sheet. Um, uh, and, and some of those visuals for you. So uh, please just reach out and, and let us know and we can send something to you so that you can have um, at the very least the resource sheet with all of the um, websites on there. Um, okay, let's take a look at the uh, other Q&A. Can they send me a screenshot of Smart911 or email? Um, I'll let me go all the way up to the, will there be handouts after this presentation or a copy of the presentation? Again, like I said, we could certainly send that resources list. Um, we might be able to email you a copy. Um, let's see, the slides are not visible. I can't see the slides, can't see the alarms. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize that you couldn't see the pictures. You couldn't see the slides. Oh, other people are saying that they could see them. Some people are saying they can't. Um, for those who can't see the slides, if you're using a mobile device, try swipe right or left. So if you're looking on a bigger screen, you should be able to see. Um, okay, so yes. Um, email, email Stella, Stella at michellebrogers.com. Okay, again, that's Stella, S-T-L-L-A at Michelle. M I C H E L L E B Rogers R O G E R S dot com all one word. Um, email Stella. 
let her know that you're interested, that you attended the elopement presentation and that you're interested in the resources there. And she will be able to help guide you further. And she can discuss the, the group coaching program with you when you reach out to her through email as well. So uh, the, uh, if you go into our chat box, the email address is right here. Uh, email info at michellebrogers.com. So you can uh, email Michelle there as well. And again, you will get information on our group coaching program, as well as any information that you might want from tonight's presentation as well. Um, let's see if there are any other questions that were posted. Okay, let's see. Um, participants, does anybody have a question that they would like me to answer? Um, I will be able to take like one or two questions. I'm going to do a hard stop at 830. So if anybody does have a question um, or two that we can answer in the next 10 minutes or so, I would be happy to do so. Um, you just need to raise your hand and let me know. Um, I really hope everybody was able to see the presentation tonight. I really hope that you guys got a lot out of it. Elopement is a very serious um, behavior to have to deal with as a parent, and it can be extremely frightening. Um, for some of the students with whom I've worked that have had elopement issues, um, I, one student I'm thinking of, we didn't even know that he was going through this, that he was eloping until we happened to notice that mom was looking pretty rough. And we asked what was going on. She said, I haven't been sleeping. He's been uh, trying to leave the house in the middle of the night. And they're like, oh my goodness, we had no idea. Why didn't you let us know? Sure enough, we went, we did an FBA and we started teaching some alternatives and putting some of these strategies into place. But um, unfortunately, before she knew that there was additional help out there, mom's solution was she was trying to sleep in the hallway outside of his bedroom door, like across the doorway. Her thinking was if he tried to leave his room in the middle of the night, he would step on her or step over her and she would feel it and she would wake up and be alerted that he was trying to leave the house and it did not always work so we got in there we put a bunch of visual supports in place we used a lot of the clinical strategies that we were discussing tonight and lo and behold we were able to get that under control and um, he learned that when he woke up in the middle of the night if he couldn't go right back to sleep that he would go and um, put on his iPad and watch some videos until the rest of the house woke up, which was much better than trying to leave the house and wandering the neighborhood until somebody came and tracked him down and escorted him back home. So um, yes, el elopement is definitely challenging, um, a very, very challenging behavior, but it's very, very important and it's very, very doable to teach some alternative strategies. Let's see, I uh, see a couple more things in the chat. Thank you. Oh, informative session. Oh, thank you. Oh, I'm, I'm really, really glad to hear that you're enjoying the presentations. And I really hope that you guys call and book these calls because then I will get to know you better and get to know your kids better and we'll be able to give you a lot of individualized suggestions and be able to coach you through a Facebook group and to really give you guys the the strategies and the tools that you need in the moment that you need them. So please, please, please book a call. We are here for you, but you got to call us so we can help you. Um, okay, so that being said, thank you so much for your participation tonight. Please reach out, look in the chat box, get that email. If you want more uh, information on any of the things that we've discussed tonight, email Michelle, email Stella, book that call, and we will be there to provide as much help and support for you as you will allow us to provide. So thank you so much for your attention tonight. I know it was a long presentation. Thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you guys at our next presentation. Uh, we will be doing our next uh, workshop. I will be doing my next workshop on Thursday, September 22nd, where we will be discussing some specific strategies, some specific clinical strategies. It will be a much shorter presentation and we will have much more time available for question and answers. 
So please join us on Thursday, September 22nd, and be sure to bring your questions with you as we will have plenty of time for questions and answers. So thank you again so much for your participation tonight. I look forward to seeing you guys again.